After the overwhelming success of our unbeatable basketball chart, success is success is a very strong word. Anyway, after we failed miserably with the unbeatable chart, we decided to make the unbeatable pool table. The table where you never miss the pocket. And this one, I guarantee you with 100% certainty that it's going to work. Stick around until the end. Now, even I got scared by that promise, but let's go. Here's the thing, of course we can't make a regular pool table, a common table. We have to come up with a different design to make it so that anyone can always sink a ball even if they've never played pool, snooker, or anything like that. So, we're going to have to make a different edge on this table. A more rounded edge. In the shape of an ellipse, an ellipse is this figure you see here on the side, kind of oval. And do you know how it comes about? When we take a sword and cut a cone. Man, oh my god. I swear we just wanted to do this thing. It was just to make a joke in the video, but I actually managed to get an ellipse. Here it is, look. It's this geometric figure. You probably thought this figure would change. Depending on the angle, I cut the right cone. If I cut it horizontally, exactly, a circle will appear. As I change the angle, the shape gets more and more stretched. When the cut no longer passes through the other side, it's no longer an ellipse. After we finished the video, I printed this. It's easier to understand. Look at the cone. If I make a cut, we'll have this geometric figure here. This black edge. And that's the ellipse. Now, if the cut passes through the base of the cone, we'll get a line here called a parabola. If the cut is exactly vertical and hits the base, the resulting line is called a hyperbola. And if we make the cut exactly horizontal, we get a circumference. Now, there's a problem, right? I want to draw a big ellipse about the size of a foosball table. What do we want to build here? I won't make a one meter clay cone to stab a sword into, since I doubt I could cut it. There's another really cool way to draw an ellipse, which is pretty simple. You can do this at home. You put two little nails on a piece of wood, and then you tie a piece of string between them. Now you just put a pen here and follow this path. Oh wow, it's that easy, but that's not it. you might even get the impression that it's a circle, but it's actually a bit flatter. By the way, what defines this flattening is the distance between the two nails. So I'm going to increase the distance between the nails a bit, but using the same string. Check this out. Look how cool. The green ellipse is much more flattened than the black one. The opposite will also happen, right? If I bring the two nails closer together, it starts to look more and more like a circle. Until, when the two nails meet, when they are at the same point, we'll have a circle. And because of that, a circle is also a type of ellipse, just like a square is also a type of rectangle. If you haven't considered that, maybe give this video a like. No? Let's move on. What's the use of studying this kind of geometric figure? It's so we can keep building pool tables. That never misses. You don't know where we find it. Ellipse in nature. In the orbit of the planets. Yes. The path that planet Earth makes around the sun is an ellipse. So, for example, when a scientist calculates the distance a rocket travels to reach Mars, he has to consider that Mars is making an elliptical orbit around the sun. But there are two characteristics, two properties of this figure here, that are very important. And the second is what will define the success of our table, okay? The first one is the following. These two little nails, in mathematics, we call focal points. And what if I take any point on the edge and measure its distance to the focal points? And adding these two distances always gives the same result. It doesn't matter where I am. The ellipse. So, this distance here, this V here, it has the same length as this other V here, and the same length as this other V here. If we use this length, do you know what it will match? With this line that goes from one edge to the other, passing through both focal points. But now, it's time to reveal the secret of it all. Let's imagine that around this ellipse, 
It's a mirror, okay? It's an elliptical mirror. What happens if you're inside this giant elliptical mirror, exactly on top of one focal point? And you aim a laser at its edge. This one, with the blue head, is you, okay? This green one is a mirror. It's the edge of a mirror. You're going to take a laser and aim it anywhere. Suppose you aim it here. You're here. Aim the laser here. The laser goes over there. It will hit the edge. And where does it go? Where will it travel to? To the other focal point. So the laser will do this here. The thing is, you can aim the laser absolutely anywhere. Let's say you aim the laser backward, okay? It comes here, and then where does it go? To the other focal point. If I aim the laser back there, the laser comes, hits the edge, and ends up at the other focal point again. If you stand at one focal point and aim the laser at the wall, it doesn't matter where you aim. It will reflect off the wall and find the next focal point. Thinking about our pool table, if I put the pocket, the hole where the ball goes in, on top of one focal point and put a starting point on top of the other focal point, I can hit the ball any way I want. It'll go to the wall and get pocketed. I can hit it in any direction, any. No matter how I hit it, the ball should always go in the pocket, at least in theory. Let's see if it works. This is a six millimeter thick plywood sheet that we use a lot with the laser here at Manual Du Mundo. All these things you see in the background were built with this plywood, okay? I'll use two. One as the base for the ball to roll on and the other for the ball to hit. This is the one I have to cut into an ellipse shape. I'll try to make an ellipse, making the most of the wood I have to get a big table. I'll mark it with a mechanical pencil because it gives a more precise line. Hmm, precise isn't a very good word right now. Everything's coming out wrong. Let's erase this and swap this thick string for a thin thread, which I think will work out much better. Also, any mistake here will make the ball miss the pocket. And that's not what I want. I promised from the start that the success rate would be 100%. Let's cut it. To cut it, let's use the jigsaw because it's the only saw I can use to make this perfect curve. I'll tell you guys, a childhood dream of mine is to have a cordless jigsaw. You can't imagine the happiness that's going through my mind right now. You must have noticed that the height of this edge isn't enough to stop the ball. So, I'll have to raise the edge so it hits exactly on the side of the ball, exactly 5 millimeters. The edge needs to be at 2.5, which is great. This Kumaru here is 9. So, if we put the Kumaru underneath here, it will be exactly at 2.5. Another problem, the ball hits but doesn't bounce. It stops at the edge. But we had already done some tests here, noticing this problem. And we noticed that if you put a rubber tube on this edge, the ball bounces. So let's install a whole edge of rubber tube here. Daniel will help me cut the rubber tube here. Meanwhile, I'll prepare the grass. Not the grass, the base of the table. Use a piece of green felt and mark it by placing the ellipse hole on top. I'll mark two focal points now. Remember, one will be the hole. Since the ball is five centimeters, a seven centimeter hole seems right. To glue the felt on top here, I'm going to use shoe glue, which is a contact adhesive. Normally, you should apply glue to both surfaces before joining, but that wastes glue. I'll just put it on the wood since the felt sticks well. In the end, I use that roller that's meant for working with fiberglass, which will make it stick well. And I also take the opportunity to open the pocket hole too. While Daniel staples the monkey's gut, I'll install the kumaru to separate the top from the bottom. Here. I need to do a neat job, closely following the edge to secure it well. I'll cut small Kumaru pieces and glue them with a mix of super glue and white glue for fast drying and use. In the end, this thing is turning out much nicer than I imagined. At the end, I can mark the focal point and securely put the lid on. Moment of truth here, preliminary test. We don't have a mallet, so we'll just use a hoe handle. Hmm. I noticed an issue. The ball bounces off the edge. Let's record in slow motion to see. The ball lifts off several centimeters, spins in the air, and falls. This completely changes the trajectory. It ruins the trajectory. This edge of ours isn't working. 
I think it's because the top of the plywood, not the center of the ball itself, is at the center. But actually, the bottom part, which is where the rubber really is, ends up being a little lower. And I think that's what makes the ball lift. Let's do a test here. It's good to be quick and test before the thing dries, because now I was able to take it off. I'm going to raise this area exactly 3 millimeters, and I'll see if when I hit it, it stops bouncing. This ellipse was our test. The ball isn't bouncing properly on the side, as if it were light reflecting in a mirror. It's not making the right angle. It jumps, and then when it lands, it's spinning. It's not good. Let's see if it's a leveling problem. The floor is well leveled. There won't be much of a way out. The ball is flying due to the monkey gut and the height where it hits. It's striking just below the ideal spot. We need to wear a professional rubber, but not today tomorrow. Danny went to a pool table store this morning and bought three items. First, a decent cloth to cover this table, so we don't use felt anymore. Second, a decent table cushion, so even this ball won't bounce off the edge anymore. And third, a pool cue so we can stop using a hoe handle. Let's start by testing this cushion to see if the ball really doesn't bounce. Wow, it's nothing like it. The good news is that it doesn't bounce with the cushion, and the bad news is that we have to put this cushion in the right position. We need to rebuild everything since this table won't work, so I'll have to try something else, okay? We've already taught how to do it with the jigsaw, marking with a nail, and using string. I don't want to redo everything. Let's just cut it with the laser. Even here, it's not that simple. You have to create countless drawings and fit everything into a small space to use minimal wood. Just so you have an idea, it took the machine over an hour to cut all of this. The first thing I'm going to do in here is put in the cloth. So I'm going to put a little bit of glue around where the pocket will be. Then, stretch the cloth over it, fastening it with a regular paper stapler, because if I use a wood stapler, it will go through this plywood. And then, we find out that we got glue all over everything. So we have to throw a bunch of water on it in a hurry to get this mess off. But to dry the water, you need an iron. And then, finally, let's keep fastening it with the clip back here. It's really stretched out. It's looking good. In Kasapa, I'm going. I'm making a star-shaped hole, stapling the other side, and adding the net. Next, we'll create a more precise edge. With five layers of plywood cut with the laser, it's going to be that perfect little ellipse. Glue five together, clamp them, and ensure they stay aligned. It's not something we can do 100% perfectly, but I don't think it will interfere much with the movement of the ball. I hope. Today's task is to glue the rubber edge to this wood. We'll use contact glue again, but I'll be more careful. Let's apply glue to both sides to see if it sticks. The issue with this glue is that after pressing the sides together, you can't adjust them. If you put something on crooked, it's going to stay crooked. So we have to do it very carefully. It's not really our expertise. Honestly, I think this is Manuel Dumundo's first time using this glue in 16 years. I think it's better now. The final step is to add some super glue and yellow wood glue here, then place it on the cloth. On top of the cloth, it doesn't stick very well. That's why we have to turn the table over and put in some nails to make sure everything is really well fixed. And now, I know. There are some very observant people out there who are going to say, But, I beret, you made the pocket bigger. I saw it. It's bigger than it was before. I went to look up what the official size of the hole on a pool table is. And it's exactly twice the diameter of the ball. So, I can make a hole that's 10 centimeters. So, exactly in the center of the hole, here in the pocket, there's a focal point. And the other focal point is here. I use the laser to make a small, one centimeter hole in the wood. So, that the field lowers a bit and we can fit the ball exactly on top. It's time for the test. 100% success in 10 shots.
I'm just letting you know that I don't even know if I'm bad at billiards, because I've pretty much never played this thing. So, there's no way. I think we've got a table, huh? Ha! That shot seems unlikely, right? Is that worth a thumbs up or not? It's approved, it works. A lot of people said you have to hit right in the middle of the ball and all that. There's not much technique to it. As long as you don't miss, you hit the ball and it goes in. See, it's easy to hit. There's one more thing we can try, but this one requires a bit more skill. The ball doesn't necessarily have to start from the focal point. It can start from anywhere else and pass through the focal point. If it goes through here, it will definitely hit the other one. Because it's the same thing as if it had started from there, and then you need to have enough skill to make the ball go over it. Let's see. There's an obvious move that we did. Which is for you to subscribe to Manual Do Mundo if you haven't subscribed yet. Because we do a lot of cool things, like this one here. That's the move over there.